you ever said, I don't agree with zoos with animal shows because they force animals to do tricks for food? Have you ever sort of lumped zoos and circuses in together as places that both exploit animals for our entertainment? If so, then you might be someone who values the ethical principles of animal rights, or you might be someone who's unsure about the whole thing and just feels a little bit uncomfortable. Perhaps you've witnessed unpleasant conditions and it's turned you off seeing animals in any sort of enclosed environment. Perhaps it's all of them, or perhaps it's none of them. If you're a conscientious advocate of animal rights, then this video might not be for you because I talk about this topic on the premise that um, humans working with and using animals is acceptable in principle. In this video, I'll be picking apart the five main differences between circuses and zoos so that next time, if you're unsure about what it is that you're witnessing, you can check off this list to gain some reassurance or choose not to spend your time or money visiting. Hello and welcome to this episode of Emma's Deep Dives, the channel where I, with your help, change the narrative on what we understand about animal welfare and the impact it has on our thoughts, feelings and decisions we make every day. If that sounds like something you're interested in being part of, then click that subscribe button and help form part of this platform and community. For those of you who are new, my name is Emma and I've specialised in animal welfare science, conducted research on bottlenose dolphins and have direct industry experience across marine mammal facilities. I keep no secrets over the fact that I don't support animal circuses. If you watched my first video about the France animal ban, you'll have learned that there are up to 500 animals used in circuses in France alone. At least 54 countries around the world now have either implemented a nationwide ban or several cities and municipalities of local bans on wild animal circuses. As it's become increasingly clear, that the welfare of these animals is almost always compromised. There are still plenty of countries that still operate animal circuses, some illegally, and there are also plenty of zoos that are so bad they could be mistaken for a circus or worse. But apart from the obvious difference in that circuses are circuses, typically seen in tents and trucks, and zoos are static and call themselves zoos, how can you be sure that the zoo you're visiting isn't just a glorified circus? Let's start with number one. They serve very different purposes. A circus's sole purpose is to provide entertainment in the form of performance art. Now there's nothing inherently wrong with this, and I'm sure many of you agree that modern circus acts can be absolutely spectacular, but just the non-animal based ones? Using animals in circuses is a really outdated practice, but it still occurs. Many people around the world still enjoy watching performing animals, but other than getting that thrill from the sort of outlandish behaviors that you can see animals perform, mixed in with the slight danger of something going horribly wrong, there's nothing more than surface level entertainment with it at best. The way in which animals are presented to the public in a zoo setting is different. Being entertained and captivated by animals is natural. And just because we enjoy marveling at a zoo animal doesn't mean to say it has to be a bad thing. But what makes the difference is the context by which we are entertained by them. One of the main purposes of zoos today is for education or edutainment. The process of being educated in a way that is also entertaining. Zoos must ensure that there's enough accessible information about the animals that you're seeing in front of you and how they connect to their wild counterparts. Facilitating these positive experiences is essential in connecting people to the more inaccessible parts of the natural world outside of zoos. This is something that is not facilitated in circuses because the information about the animals and their natural habitats is irrelevant to any part of the performance. Difference two, training style and the purpose of animal training. This and the next reason are the primary areas where animal welfare is most negatively impact in circus environments. The, the purpose for training animals in circuses is, as you guessed it, for entertainment. Due to the nature of circus acts and their constant traveling, the requirement for patience whilst animals are learning new behaviors is not forgiving. If you have to leave 
and get your elephant or lion in the truck. You might not have the luxury of days, weeks or even months on your side in order to allow the animal to learn at its own pace in a positive environment. Instead, animals are shaped to perform species inappropriate behaviors using very aversive training techniques like being beaten, poked, hooked, chained up and not being fed until the animal eventually learns what the trainer wants when it's not punished after demonstrating the desired behavior. It's certainly effective, which is why many dog owners still praise the power of shock collars and fences, but it's incredibly traumatic and stressful for the animals, if that wasn't already obvious. In contrast, training animals in zoo environments serves a significantly different purpose. So many animals are now being trained in zoos and aquariums, uh, like a whole host of different fish species, reptiles, birds, cephalopods, and it's no longer just reserved for the largest and most charismatic animals. The reason why training practices are booming in zoos is because it has huge benefits for animal welfare, including reducing or removing stressful husbandry and veterinary practices, exercise, cognitive engagement, enrichment, building relationships, and even building resilience to new objects, tasks, and individuals. The way in which training is conducted in modern accredited facilities is through using a psychological principle called positive reinforcement. I'll happily talk about that in another video, but basically, if you reinforce or reward the behavior or approximations to a behavior that you want to train, then the animal is likely to increase the same behaviors again until the desired outcome is achieved. This could be training an animal to voluntarily present a limb or its tail for a vet to take a blood sample. It also means that you don't have to catch, trap, or sedate an animal in order to do something as simple as moving it from one location to another. This is much better for animal health, welfare, and building trusting bonds with their trainers or keepers. Number three, the habitat or environment. The nature of a traveling circus does not lend itself to creating an environment where animals can express or exhibit natural and normal behaviors. Being on the move constantly means spending most of their time in cramped cages, boxes or trucks, possibly running out of water, and lying or standing in soil bedding for hours and hours and hours and hours. You get the picture. There's plenty of research into the welfare impacts of transportation on livestock animals. And by comparison, they've only really transported the one time in that environment, not constantly driven hundreds of kilometers every few weeks or days. It'd be like keeping your horse constantly in its box while you drive it around, only to take it out once a day to exercise it, if that. You just wouldn't do it. Zoos, on the other hand, should cater to animal welfare as their first priority by giving animals choice and control over their environment and allowing them to express natural behaviors. There's a growing body of literature covering the development of animal care plans for groups of different species in zoos. Experts will have an understanding of what animals require from their wild habitats, and then we'll try and replicate this as much as possible. Basic things like, does this animal need a dust bath or a water bath? Does this animal need to have a choice of perches at different heights so it can see all areas of its enclosure? How does this animal need to feed? All these things and more are considered. And in cases where space is limited or hunting behaviors can't be fulfilled as they would be in the wild, creative alternatives have to be developed and are constantly improving. But just because sometimes these might look unnatural to us doesn't mean that they can't replicate naturally occurring behaviors in animals. Number four, conservation. This might be a pretty obvious difference, but circuses aren't exactly hailed and renowned for their conservation efforts. And <laughs> there's not really much more to say about that. They just don't contribute to conservation. Zoos, unfortunately, also get a bad rap for their conservation efforts. And I believe that's because the way in which zoos contribute to conservation is largely misunderstood. Many people believe that the role of zoos is to create a viable breeding stock of animals from endangered species, which then 
they maintain and aim to release into the wild. There certainly have been instances of successful reintroduction programs for endangered species, such as restoring the California condor, but operations like this are extremely expensive, risky and complex. In the most practical sense, successful conservation efforts are conducted in the wild that involve direct collaboration with scientists and communities on the ground. Conservation is a massive, complicated, interdisciplinary practice spanning science, international law, geopolitics, economics and industry. So there's no one-size-fits-all approach to doing it. And because zoos don't necessarily fit some people's narrow expectations of conservation, they are written off as non-contributors or institutions simply paying lip service. This is one of the reasons why critics tar zoos with the same brush as circuses, because they can be viewed as being dishonest, which simply isn't the case. The most effective ways that zoos can contribute to conservation is through raising money and grants, working with partnership programs and supporting field conservation projects, as well as ensuring that their own facilities operate in an environmentally sustainable way. You can check out the various financial contributions that the Association of Zoos and Aquariums has made to the global conservation projects. I've linked their website and their most recent reports, which they're actually really interesting and pleasing to read. In fact, even I was surprised um, at the sheer scale of the impact that they have. And that's just one accrediting body for zoos. There are others that contribute in similar ways. <laughs> the other ways that zoos contribute to conservation, but also largely sets them apart from circuses, is research. And that's reason number five. Going back to the whole point of this video, which is about how zoos and circuses are different, in a research context, it's not in the interests of circuses or scientists to have researchers looking at these animals. Research takes time, cooperation, and more importantly, healthy animals in order to acquire meaningful data for scientific observations and experiments. Zoos, to a large extent, can provide suitable baselines and controls that scientists need in order to reliably study animals. Because of the inherently stressful nature of circuses, there's no way that the animal's behavior is representative of either wild or zoo housed animals. Not only that, I don't imagine any researcher who cares about animals and their welfare would be remotely comfortable trying to access and study them in that environment. I'm sure a few university ethics committees might have some heated arguments about granting access to this type of study in the first place. Having said that, there are a couple of studies that have investigated the impact of circuses and I've linked those below in the description as well. There are lots of anti-zoo critics that say zoo research cannot accurately represent animals in the wild and that the only way to study them is by observing them in nature. That's all very nice and everything, but the two completely go hand in hand. There are so many things that we know only about certain species of animals because of our ability to have studied them in zoos especially our understanding of dolphin communication, which has been studied extensively in zoos, and it's impossible to scientifically control that in the wild. So there you have it, the five fundamental differences between circuses and zoos. I must state though, I don't believe that human-based circus acts bad, as performance, art and culture contributes massively to the economy, and it's still tremendously exciting and entertaining but I hope I've at least given you some useful information and guidance to help field any uncertainties you might have when it comes to conflating animal circuses and zoos. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and contribute your thoughts and comments below to keep the discussion going. And I'll see you on the next Emma's Deep Dives. Bye.